We're back at Mongo DB Local here in the Big Apple. Coming to you live from New York City. We're really excited to have Sahir Azam in the studio here. He's the Chief Product Officer of MongoDB, Cube alum. So here, great to see you again. Good to see you. Thank you for having me. Big week. Yes. Big, big year for you guys. Lots going on. Wow, lots going on. I mean, the announcements are coming through, the ecosystem, the partnerships. Can you help us connect the dots on all these announcements and how do they help customers drive value from AI? Yeah, there's a variety of different things we're doing. I mean, um, I was excited today to announce a bunch of just capabilities and enhancements across the, you know, the broad developer data platform that we've built and expanded a lot over the last few years. So everything from kind of core foundational stuff, continuously improving the performance of our platform, the security capabilities, the resiliency, which is crucially important to customers who build mission critical applications, right, yeah. to obviously new features that are have, that are newer to the market, like stream processing, getting to GA, and and really uh, all the feedback we've gotten over the last year around. On that on the AI front, I think there's really um, a few key areas. I think um, our vector capabilities as part of our platform have been one of the most fast, if not I think the fastest adopted set of features that we've added in the last few years. We're seeing a lot of buzz and excitement around customers trying to apply generative AI to their applications or build new applications from the ground up that are very AI driven. Uh, we also have been working closely with our partners uh, like AWS, Azure, and now even Google on training their large foundational models to be really good at recommending quality MongoDB code. And then we've actually taken some of those models and implemented them in our own developer tools to make our own developer ecosystem more productive. And so there's a variety of things that we're doing, even legacy modernization, so helping AI you know, assist people in getting off of old applications that they want to modernize, get onto a more modern technology like MongoDB. So uh, really a lot of broad applicability. Obviously the buzz and excitement of people trying this all out after they announced it this morning is really great to see. Is that is that legacy modernization, is that mostly code assist? Uh, or it's, in, 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 in migration or? It's a, it's a, I think over time it's going to touch the whole life cycle, but the areas that we've been focused on most uh, most directly right now, first is how do we understand the pattern of queries that are going into an existing system, so start helping analyze the existing schema and what it should look like in a document or uh, automated oriented fashion. So actually models can help with that. We're also seeing that a lot of these applications were built perhaps decades ago where the developer teams that built them are no longer even at the company. So like if you want to go modernize that app, the first thing is like, how do I even understand it? Where's Joe? Yeah. <laughs> so like and, yeah, so code analyzing and even understanding how an application was constructed um, is really interesting. Models can assist with that process of understanding. And we've definitely seen a lot of process also on the testing side. You can actually generate tests out of existing code and then reuse those same tests by refactoring them for the new application on the tail end. And a lot of what you know is the challenge of modernization it's not just the raw effort which is obviously code conversion understand it. it's actually the trust that you actually know how to validate that things are working well and that's where the testing comes in so we have work going on in all these different areas uh, we're learning a lot this is a new area for all of us in the industry and that is one promising area that we're spending more and more time on and just so just on vector yeah it was amazing to me i think it was a reinvent we might have been talking, and, uh, and, and there was a study, the, de the developer uptake in, in vectors generally, but specifically MongoDB vector, this is before you even went GA. Yeah. It had the highest NPS, and it had the highest adoption uh, of any vector capability. Which yeah, and the retool study, which you know, the they were at study, the front right. end of AI yeah. themselves, actually, yeah. which is cool. Yeah, that was pretty amazing. Yeah. Now, I want to ask you, so you, you shared in the keynote um, that you... Uh, added, you know, significant perf read performance up 25%, 60% for time se series queries yep. improvement, uh, over 40%, you know, improvement in bulk loads. So, how are you, were you able to achieve that? Yeah, it's, and you know, there's no one sort of silver bullet. You know, the approach across different areas of a complex system, like an operational database, you know, we made a variety of different changes. So, the first thing was obviously saying, like, you know, we always always are putting effort in performance. It's one of the key areas, same with security, resiliency, durability, obviously, of data is always, it's not always the stuff I talk about on stage, like the newer feature capabilities, but it's always a big part of our investment. So I just want to kind of level set there, but I was especially proud of the progress we made in this particular release. And the two things I'd call out is one, on the query system, we really looked end to end. We looked at all the way 
all of the different steps in the process from when a query gets submitted to how it gets planned to how it gets executed in the system. And it wasn't kind of one change that unlocked that, I think, 25%, 40% stat that I talked about. It was a series of small changes that when in aggregate, when we looked at the result and we doing our benchmarking and testing, we were like, wow, this is really a big change and a good step forward. And but on the other hand, something like uh, time series you mentioned, yep. that was a, a you know an approach that typically you see in analytics databases around block processing that we brought to time series data in an operational context, which allows you to kind of batch together updates of multiple documents at once versus uh, and versus kind of processing each of them sequentially. So it's a technique that we applied that you know, unlock that gain. And so there's no kind of one thing, it's a variety of different things compounding across different areas of the platform. I really just wanted to take this opportunity to highlight how much of our investment goes into those areas. And, and I can tell you from talking to a lot of customers, it's not just the new products, the new features they care about, they care a lot about raw price performance, resiliency, security of the system for the product they already have on mission critical applications. And that's why we wanted to really highlight that this year. Now, I would say Atlas is the crown jewel. It's a big chunk of the business. That's over two thirds of the business now. Um, and and yet the non-Atlas stuff is actually still doing pretty well. Yeah, yeah, I'm we're sort of interested there. So two questions, two part yeah. questions. One is help me understand the Atlas updates, where you put yeah. your resources there. And are you seeing now, because we're hearing it from customers that they want to do kind of private AI, do mm -hmm. things, you know, on-prem, for instance. Sure. You play in both camps, so yeah. I mean, I'm curious as to where are you putting your, your bets uh, on or your investments in Atlas and what you're seeing in terms of that Definitely. balance. So many of the announcements, especially the stuff we just talked about, like performance, resiliency, that affects all of our environments, whether that's on-premises, uh, enterprise customers, whether it's our community edition, these are foundational improvements, and of course we run that in Atlas, so Atlas customers benefit from it as well. So a lot of the stuff spans our entire portfolio. On the Atlas side, specifically, there are certain capabilities, newer products that are uh, basically architect in a cloud-native way, and therefore are really only in Atlas. Things like stream processing, so the expansion of that capability, getting it to GA, some of the new feature announcements that we saw there. Um, but anything also with our developer tooling hits both camps, the self-managed, self-hosted customers on-premises, as well as those leveraging Atlas in the public cloud. So I want to be clear that most of the announcements we made are really about both sides of that. Now, we are definitely hearing a lot of demand for customers who, whether it's they want private AI, now that can even be done in an Atlas context, but they also, there are applications that have data that's going to be operationalized in their own data center. And so one of the big announcements we made, that an area that we're kicking off a new project on, is bringing the search and vector capabilities that we've had for you, uh, for now, you search for years, vector for a little over a year, to our community edition. Yeah. And that, you know, in many ways is an investment in our community, making sure that the millions of builders across the world that get started by downloading our, uh, you know, our free version of the product can get the breadth of capabilities for these AI applications. So we are very much a run anywhere company. And I'd say we're even seeing that extend to the edge. You know, we announced a new version of Mongo that can run in sort of edge locations, retail stores, airplanes, boats, all of that, because we are seeing data getting more distributed. And obviously the cloud is maybe the centerpiece of the architecture for a lot of these customers, but there are going to be da corporate data centers we believe in some applications that are never going to move, and then there's going to be data even more distributed across the edge over time. So tell me more about the edge piece of it, because yeah. that's really, we had Nomic on earlier, yeah. and we were we were just talking about the changes that are going on in inference. Mm -hmm. You know, you're going to you're going to see a, a 10x improvement in performance and a and a one tenth, you know, the cost of running yeah. inference. I mean, it's just going to be exponential. Sure. What are you guys doing there specifically? Yeah. So. Um, in particular, there's a few things. One, are a lot of these are these partnerships, right? You know, the AI stack is emerging. There's a bunch of innovative new companies that we've spent, Nomic being one of them that we've spent, you know, the last 18 months getting integrated with, getting to learn what they're doing, building connections to all these amazing founders. And we actually have formed partnerships in particular with inference players like Firefly, uh, you know, who uh, was here, I think, this week with us, as well as others, to make sure that all the surrounding components that you need to power a modern Gen AI application works seamlessly with our data layer and data technology. Because, you know, I think it's pretty well known in the industry, like, you have to get your data at a good place and customers' IP is in their data before you can really unlock the true potential of AI. So you're seeing us really, I think, pivot to being even more ecosystem focused, even more technology 
technology integration partner focus so that we can empower these new inference engines or these new model or embedding providers like Nomic to work well with our data that people have been building applications on for MongoDB for almost now 15 years. I want to ask you, uh, thank you for that by the way, I want to ask you about the relational model versus the document model. Sure. Explain to me why an API from relational is not good enough. Sure. Yeah, I think it's it's um, it's a combination of both the data model and the API. And and certainly there are a lot of relational databases. You know, a big portion of the ecosystem is going to always have relational databases. We're not we're not crazy, but we've been focused on really saying why does MongoDB exist? It exists because a lot of modern programming languages, first and foremost, are object oriented. And in a relational database paradigm, the data model of rows and tables in a relational database was built at a time where we were optimizing as an industry for expensive hardware. So everything was about storing as efficiently on disk. Fast forward 30 years later to when MongoDB was coming around, hardware was, as we all know, coming down in prices. Storage was, is now extremely cheap. Compute's gone down significantly. And so the cost of infrastructure is no longer the constraint. It's the cost and the time of the developers and the people that's the expensive fees. So the, our founders saw that the constraints had changed. And so therefore they were saying, how do we persist data in a way that's much more natural for developers because now we can store all the data that gets accessed together cheaply. And that was never really possible with the hardware paradigms back when relational databases were you know, invented by IBM you know, all those years ago. And so that means that now object-oriented programming languages, developers working with you know, formats of data like JSON, which is like the lingua franca of the yeah. modern internet, are much more natural in terms of how, how you store that in this document-oriented structure. And that really frees developers to just move extremely quickly. We also can do things like schema adjustments, schema migrations without having to take the database down, right? In an always-on digital experience world, that's really important. That's kind of one aspect of why the data model and then also the API, you know, one of the things when, I, when we talk to developers is, what do you think about the MongoDB query language? And they're like, I don't think about the MongoDB query language because for me it disappears into the code that I'm writing because it's so natural and idiomatic. Versus SQL, which is a whole different language you have to learn and inject in the middle of another language as you're coding. So that's the other aspect of why developers love MongoDB and the experience around it. It's those two fundamental things pretty, combined. Pretty ingenious when you go back to the sort of founding premise. Yeah. You think about that and the whole open source community. Of course, at the time, people like, ah, oh, it won't scale. Well, you've proven that wrong. Yeah, and you know, building an operation database system that not just you know can serve you know lightweight applications but can scale deal with the you know security the resiliency the durability guarantees to be a general purpose database takes hundreds of millions of dollars of investment in many years and that's what we've been you know very fortunate to have a very long-term oriented management team board and also investor community that has saw the potential of us and what we've been able to deliver to market. In, in the little analyst breakout, I asked you a yeah. question. I'd love to get it on the record. So sure. I basically asked a question. It was sort of a snarky question, but hey, RAG is really easy. You know, it's simple. Um, it, you know, it's not driving like tons of ROI. What do you see in terms of, first of all, how are you applying RAG internally? Because uh, you're, you know, learnings. Sure. And, and how are you helping your customers get to bigger dollars? Yeah. Definitely. So in terms of internal usage, we have a variety of different use cases. I'm sure there's some that I'm not even aware of yeah. uh, internally at MongoDB, but a couple that uh, I, I can call out. You know, we built our own sort of RAG framework as well as um, our own vector database was used for this to uh, enable sort of a natural language extension to our documentation. You know, MongoDB is a very popular technology. Our documentation is one of our most traffic sites because developers download the technology, sign up for Atlas, they want to, you know, learn from all our examples. So now it's just much easier to use these uh, AI-powered ways of finding the right answer for whatever problem you're trying to solve. That was a, uh, a RAG use case internally at MongoDB. Yeah. But we also have a bunch of other use cases now that help drive efficiency in the way we support customers, from our technical support teams to our customer success teams, where we're accessing a bunch of different information. So not just information in MongoDB, but information from our corporate systems, our CRM, our um, you know our internal knowledge base where we store any you know support data and all of that. And so we had to really think about with our CISO and our CIO, what is the right governance structure so we can enable APIs from any applications but that can maintain and make sure that developers who are building all these systems internally and these apps internally 
aren't accidentally exposing information about whatever. It could be one employee's salary versus another. It could be you know some sensitive information about a customer. All of this needs to be protected, and so that's where you know rag to as a concept or proving out a simple use case can be pretty straightforward and I agree with that. But doing it at across many use cases in an environment where you have sensitive information, you gotta govern that, that is actually quite challenging. And so we've learned a lot about that and now we've actually taken that knowledge and some of those technology partners that we used, integrated them into our partnership program and now we're actually helping customers go down a similar journey. No shadow rag. No <laughs> That's shadow dangerous rag. stuff. It's like, it's a tricky balance. On one hand, we want to, we're a very like, you know, innovation focused, like very bottoms up kind of culture at MongoDB. So we want, ex so the goal has always been not to say no, but to say, here are your tools as fast as possible that are safe, but go at it once with, once you're within these constraints, go at it on the innovation, yeah. the hackathons, and it's been great. And I'm kind of joking about Shadow, but you think about the Hadoop era, the big data, yeah, yeah. we're just experimenting. Sure. And then, you know, a year and a half, two years later, the organization would say, well, wait a minute, we have to govern this. Yes. And so you're getting out ahead of that, saying here's a tool set that yeah. you use if you're going to experiment. Right. These are the boundaries that you And I do think um, with AI in particular, we're seeing that customers in the enterprise especially, they understand this. Yeah. Right there very much intrigued by the potential we all are in terms of where, like some of the use cases that are going to be possible, whether it's driving efficiency and improving the bottom line or whether it's creating new business models, new customer experiences. I think it's everyone's really very much a board level kind of uh, thing around that. But at the same time, established brands have a reputation to, uh, to protect and customer data and personal information to make sure it doesn't leak into the wrong places or that they're recommending the right best practices. So they're also being very careful and cautious, which is making this governance and ethics around how these things get applied. It definitely is, a, is an important topic. Impossible to answer question, but I'll ask it anyway. Mm -hmm. and it's, it's related to the future of apps. How do you see the future of apps? If I asked that question of you in like 1999, 2000, you would have seen Salesforce and you maybe predicted some kind of SaaS model emerging. Yeah. But you yeah. probably wouldn't have predicted the iPhone, you know, maybe. But what kind of framework should we think about in terms of the characteristics of the app in the future, the intelligent data app, if yeah. we can call it that? How should we think about the future of applications? Yeah, I think it, it is a hard question, but I, you know, I can proxy some of the stuff that I've been reading or watching or hearing from some of the, you know, kind of experts and just our ecosystem and all that. One, I do think the the long term potential is absolutely something we believe in. I think the, the you know the hype is warranted in terms of where things will go over the long term. But as you know, we've all seen multiple technology cycles. There's going to be some hype, and then there's some disillusionment when things don't deliver against that hype. And but over the long term, things really do get there, if not exceed our expectations. And I think AI is going through its own journey around that. I don't want to try to predict where we are on that curve, but I, I definitely think early, early, <laughs> early is early. definitely the thing. But, you know, I saw one of our uh, investors does an AI conference and, you know, there's an amazing talk where they kind of compared the, when the iPhone came out and when the iPhone first came out, you know, they were, it was a really great presentation. They're like, the first wave of apps were pretty simplistic. The flashlight app, you know, these utility apps that had some value, but they were quite small. But only a few years later, you saw the DoorDashes, the Ubers, the, you know, Instagrams, these applications that created completely new business models or experiences that we couldn't conceive of. And I think with AI, we're seeing glimpses of that, but I don't think anyone can really say, what are the big, where's things really going to go? Who are the winners? What are the, I, but I, but I know it's coming. And so I think that's exciting. I definitely think also that um, one of the things we're looking at that's promising is you know, the whole idea of agentic workflows. Like how does not just a model solve a particular narrow problem, but how can it help you know, one orchestration agent kind of do more complex business workflows over time. And you see some interesting demos come out from some startups of, I think, where things can go very early, but we're excited about the potential of that and are watching that space as well. Yeah, I think the, the other thing I would add to that excellent answer would be the impact on industry. I mean, you think about yeah. how mobile banking yeah. just completely changed the way in which we interact with our financial institutions. You know, the stock trading, even though you had internet yeah. trading, now it's just like boom, boom, Robin Hood. It's yeah. Like, <laughs> And the power and ability to reason about all this unstructured data 
truly in a way that wasn't really mainstream or possible, except for maybe the pockets of the you know the largest, most sophisticated tech companies in the world. Yep. That's going to be really empowering and democratizing for any organization that's building software with all the technologies that are emerging, and that's really exciting. So here, amazing interview as always. Thanks. So Great much to see you. Thank you for having us. You're very yeah. welcome, and thank you for uh, for your attention here. <laughs> we'll be back right after this short break. MongoDB live from New York City. You're watching the Cube. <laughs>